Let's now turn to the question of the future. How do you resolve this conflict? We're told it's very complicated. It's very hard to resolve this conflict. In fact, there's been a settlement on the table for the past 30 years. Every person in this room has almost certainly heard of it. It's called the two-state settlement. What does the two-state settlement mean? It's not complicated. A full Israeli withdrawal from the territories it occupied in June 1967, in accordance with that principle of the inadmissibility of acquiring territory by war, with, as President Carter correctly puts it, the possibility of mutually agreeable land swaps on the one side, and recognition of Israel's right to live in peace with its neighbors based in Articles 1 and 2 of the United Nations Charter on the other side. That's the settlement that's been out there. Is it controversial? Let's look at the votes. Because it happens every year, the United Nations General Assembly in November and December vote on the, uh, a resolution called uh, Peaceful Settlement of the Palestine Question. 1989, the vote's 151 to 3. Not very close. The three dissenting votes, United States, Israel, and Dominica. <laughs> 2006, a lot has changed in the world between 89, 1989 and, and 2006. Uh, you'll be surprised, some of you, though it's the Kennedy School, so you shouldn't be too surprised. Among other things, there are 40 new nations in the United Nations. In 1989, it was 154 nations. Now it's 192. The world has changed in dramatic ways. But in this question of the two-state settlement, there's no controversy at all. The vote this past year, this past December, I checked just to be sure uh, if there were any changes, but there weren't. The vote was 157 nations in favor of the two-state settlement, seven against. The seven are always the same. It's on the web. Go and check it yourself. Every year it's the same. The United States, Israel, Nauru, N-A-U-R-U, Palu, P-A-L-A-U, <laughs> Tuvalu, T-U-V-A-L-U, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, and then the United States and Israel. This year, you know, um, Tuvalu dropped out and Australia dropped, dropped in, but that's the picture. No controversy at all. The only obstacle to resolving this conflict is Israel's refusal to withdraw. Carter writes in his book, Israel's continued control and colonization of Palestinian land have been the primary obstacles to a comprehensive peace agreement. And in that famous last paragraph, it begins, peace, the last paragraph of the book, peace will come to Israel and the Middle East only when the Israeli government is willing to comply with international law by accepting its legal borders. That's exactly what the UN vote has been showing for the past 30 years. In fact, it goes further back than the past 30 years. One of the most eminent legal scholars and students of the laws of war, he taught at Harvard, a fellow named Quincy Wright. Has anyone heard of him? Quincy Wright? Uh, you have. Okay, very prominent scholar. I was reading an article by him last night. <clears throat> well, he's long since passed away, but he was a formidable scholar. Uh, I was reading an article by him last night. This is 1968. He writes, in view of the acceptance of UN Resolution 242 by the adjacent Arab states except Syria, the major obstacle to progress seems to be the refusal of Israel to do so and to agree to withdraw from occupied territories. That's been the same problem for 40 years. Carter's book is hardly novel. It's hardly original. This is what Quincy Wright was writing, not in 2007, but in 1968. Well, let's now turn, return to that question of <clears throat> applying these principles, the principle of reciprocity. The second condition that was put on Hamas when it came to power 
was that it had to recognize uh, the state of Israel. To me, that seems to be pretty non-controversial. Israel is a member state of the United Nations under Article 2 of the United Nations and Article 1. Uh, it has the right to live in peace with its neighbors, and it ought to be recognized. That's pretty straightforward. But then the question is the one that Shabtai Rosen brings up, the question of reciprocity. No Israeli government, none, has ever recognized a Palestinian state in the whole of the occupied territories with East Jerusalem as its capital, what international law demands. As the world calls on Hamas to recognize Israel, the current Israeli government is building a wall that annexes 10% of the West Bank, that annexes Jerusalem, that severs the West Bank in two or three parts. In addition, in addition, it's ethnically cleansing the Jordan Valley and has, to quote Bet Selim, de facto annexed the uh, de facto annexed Jordan Valley. Carter writes, if you look at the record, hardly controversial, he says, the wall will complete the enclosure of a severely truncated Palestine, a small portion of its original size, compartmentalized, divided into cantons, occupied by Israeli security forces, and isolated from the outside world. Now, his main academic critic, or his only one, Kenneth Stein, he dissents. He says, the wall, the wall which will annex about 45% of the West Bank, cut it up into fragments, and so forth. He says, this wall might contribute to the achievement of a two-state solution. Well, almost. One state and one prison. The differences between Israel and Hamas, one, first, although Hamas has been ambiguous, on its willingness to recognize Israel on the pre-June 67 borders. It goes hot and cold, no reason to dispute it. Its re recent statements have been more forthcoming, but you can make the case that they've been ambiguous. Fine. Israel hasn't been ambiguous, however. Israel has always categorically opposed a Palestinian state on the June 1967 borders. The only other difference is while Hamas sometimes speaks about destroying the Jewish state, Israel is in practice dismembering the Palestinian state as we speak. <clears throat> the hypocrisy was, I think, put quite uh, effectively, compellingly, by John Dugard. Some of you may know him as the, he's considered to be the father of the human rights legislation in South Africa. He's now the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, and recently he wrote as follows. In effect, the Palestinian people have been subjected to economic sanctions. The first time an occupied people has been so treated. This is difficult to understand. Israel is in violation of major Security Council and General Assembly resolutions dealing with unlawful territorial change and the violation of human rights and has failed to implement the, the 2004 advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Yet, Israel escapes any sanctions. Instead, the Palestinian people, rather than the Palestinian Authority, have been subjected to possibly the most rigorous form of international sanctions imposed in modern times. And then he goes on to say, it is interesting to recall that the Western states refused to impose meaningful economic sanctions on South Africa to compel it to abandon apartheid on the grounds that this would harm the black people of South Africa. No such sympathy is extended to the Palestinian people or their human rights. Once again, once again, a flagrant violation of the principle of reciprocity. 
Well, if what I'm saying is true, and obviously I can't fully document it, and you'll have to, at least in part, take it as a leap of faith, uh, if what I say is true, the question arises, where does all the controversy come from? And I would say that there are two kinds of controversy on the Israel-Palestine conflict. There's legitimate controversy, which people can disagree on or agree on. And then there's the fabricated controversy.